think it's important to show that this issue affects every community, you know, every person, every family in some way, unfortunately, and it seems to be spreading even more. So when we booked this interview, it was to focus on the what happened in Monterey. But since then, there had been another shooting in California. There's just too much of this going on. As someone who has been studying and monitoring gun violence and its ill effects on our children, what were your initial thoughts when you heard of these two incidents? Well, unfortunately, as we're finding out, they're occurring even more frequently. And in the United States, this really is a, a unique situation where we have come to the point where we know that multiple mass shootings are going to occur uh, every month. And again, the definition really is when four or more people are shot. Uh, obviously, the ones where more people are injured or killed tend to get more of the publicity. But there's continued mass shootings that we don't even hear about um, in the background, unfortunately. And so when these things happen, two things come to mind. We're going to talk about gun violence. That's what this segment is really about. But let's talk about mental health and its re relation to gun violence. It's very easy for people to point to, you know, mental health as being kind of the root cause, but that actually is not true. We know that individuals with mental health disorders are actually at much higher risk for being a victim rather than a perpetrator. So of course, mental health is an important public health issue that we should address for its own importance, but that is not the solution to solving the public health crisis of gun violence in the United States. How do you explain it though? So say for instance, now they're saying that there's alleged jealousy involved in the mass shooting in Monterey and in the shooting in Half Moon Bay, it was a disgruntled worker. The first thing in mind is mental health. Clearly their thinking is not what we would consider to be normal, but you can also see how those acts are very impulsive. Again, there's a lot of details we don't know, but it's completely unclear if anything could have been predicted, right? If there was any known mental illness that could have prevented this sort of shooting. That's why certain types of legislation like the extreme risk protection order laws, uh, and California does have um, one of these laws, they're also known as ERPO or red flag laws, are important because if somebody posts something or says something, either that they want to shoot somebody else or maybe shoot themselves, that there is a mechanism through the legal system, through the judicial system, to basically allow the courts to prohibit either the possession or purchase of a firearm by an individual who's at risk for either harming themselves or harming someone else. But why would these people have, for instance, the Monterey um, shooting guy had an assault weapon? Again, California actually has some very strong firearm laws, but you know we're all limited by the laws in our state as well as federal laws. And um, assault weapons, you know, are actually growing in popularity. I actually recently saw an article about an assault weapon that is being marketed towards uh, children even, even though children are not legally able to own guns in most states. And so um, it's just having these types of weapons available and easily um, obtainable by uh, people does increase the dangerous um, sort of environment we all live in, unfortunately, in the United States. Right. So the cycle seems to be, and there's a graph for it. Um, so uh, gun violence, mass shooting leads to thoughts and prayers, leads to now because of social media, there's a debate and there's interviews like this one, you know, talking about gun violence, talking about what, what can we do, talking about these things. But then after a while, it dissipates, right? The intensity, it's forgotten and then people go back to normal and then another mass shooting happens because nothing has been done is i mean discourse is not enough well i would actually argue in the last few years i have seen sort of a cultural change and at least we're now starting to have the discussion i've been studying uh, firearm injuries uh, and deaths particularly in the pediatric population since the early 2010s and basically even in the medical community, there wasn't a lot of interest in talking about it or publishing scientific articles. But now there is a public discourse. And unfortunately, many of the times it is spurred by a mass shooting, but at least we're at a place where we're talking about it. And, you know, last year for the first time in, um, you know, nearly 20 years, 
there was actually real legislation that was passed to address some of these issues. And again, there's still work that needs to be done, but at least we were able to pass legislation on a federal level to expand background checks um, for those up to 21 years of age, to uh, protect victims of intimate partner violence, to uh, address gun trafficking, to encourage passage of these ERPO laws in states that don't have them, um, and also to you know provide more resources to mental health. And what, as I said before, that is not going to be the solution. But of course, it's important to address mental health because of its importance on its own. So I think there is a cultural change. Are things moving fast enough? No, we know not given the increasing numbers of injuries and deaths from mass shootings. And I do need to add that that is actually you know, less than 2% of all the firearm deaths are due to mass shootings. And so again, it's an important part of spurring on conversation, but we really need to address all the other homicides and suicides actually, firearm suicides, which is an important cause of suicide death, particularly in um, older white males. Firearm advocates are saying that we need, we need the weapons, we need the guns to protect ourselves protect our families, protect our country. You know, certainly in the United States here, we're known for, you know, people being able to stand up for their rights and, and having the freedom to choose. That is one of the things that makes this, you know, country a place we want to live. However, I think that has to go with the knowledge of the risks of whatever behavior it is, right? So it's important to know that if you have firearms in your home, that there is an increased risk of somebody in your household actually being injured or even killed by that. And that could be a three-year-old who accidentally finds the, uh, you know, handgun in the dresser drawer that you're using to try to keep your family safe. If it's not secured safely, it turns out the way firearms are designed, a three-year-old can actually shoot it. If you compare it to something like a motor vehicle, you know, that's designed so that only the person who can, you know, who has the keys and who's tall enough to drive it can turn on the ignition. So, so there are things that we can do that if you feel like you want to have a farm in your home, that we should be able to protect our loved ones. Um, and so again, there are things that we can do to try to keep ourselves safe. Um, if we do feel like farms are going to be a part of our lives. If you're gonna buy a gun, I can't convince you not to buy it probably, right? Cause you don't feel safe and I can't convince you that you're not safe, but at least then secure it safely and also understand the risks, especially as you said, if you have children in the home, they have to understand there are risks, but there are ways to mitigate those risks. On the other side, people are saying, look at the guy who stopped the armed man, the, sh the shooter in the Monterey shooting, he was unarmed. It's hard to convince one side or the other, but I think it is important to know that you can be unarmed and still, you know, disarm a situation. Uh, and, and again, that's what our, you know, community security forces are for as well. So, but in the end, for parents like myself, the bottom line is, how do we protect our children physically? but also emotionally and mentally. How do we explain these things to them? I know they are gonna hear about it, you know, on the news or, you know, what they hear in the background. And uh, as you know, as a parent, they actually pick up on a lot of stuff that we may not necessarily intend them to. And so I think it's actually important to have very honest conversations that are of course developmentally appropriate. If you uh, live in a family or interact with those uh, who do have farms, having conversations with your children about safety and that, you know, these are not toys, that they are dangerous, that they can injure and kill um, other uh, individuals. But then, you know, having honest conversations about how they keep themselves safe and how to keep other people safe. We do also know that children don't listen to everything we say. So you cannot rely on their judgment to know, right? Even if you tell them, don't touch a gun. There've been actually like experiments that show that, that the kids are gonna touch it. So if there are farms in the home by uh, storing them unloaded with the ammunition and the gun locked away separately. Well, I know people feel helpless when they hear about these shootings um, and deaths. So there are some wonderful lay organizations and it's a way for you to feel like you have a voice to advocate um, and hopefully um, you know, improve the world. That's important and also voting and making sure that other people that you know also vote because who we vote both at the state level and at the federal level are really important in, um, you know, in making the policy that will hopefully you know, make this country safer moving forward.